All right, let's do this. Cheers, first sip of coffee. Good morning, Wayne Boo Atkins. You are first, my friend. You got the bragging rights today. What's up, Tim Kane, Greg Holmes, Brandon Hollinger, Randy New, Jerry Leon, uh, Rachel up there in Minnesota. October is checking in from the YouTube. Dennis Smith and Bob Christie. Oh, my goodness. Andy Volland with the big good morning. He's got a lot of energy, that Andy Volland. Hope he, uh, what's the good word? Damn, what a tearjerker that um, grocery game show was last night with Carl Ruiz. Uh, I watched. It was entertaining. And then I turned it off. Uh, so I DVR'd it. I'll probably watch it um, maybe after I do this. I ju it's just, uh, man, when I think of Carl Ruiz, um, I laugh myself uh, silly most of the time. But, uh, you know, seeing him. On guys' grocery games like that, in all his glory, just kicking ass, knowing he had so much to offer and so much to give, knowing the inside stuff that um, they were trying to figure out a show for Carl and all that. He had the world by the goddamn balls, and then he drops dead on us like that. It's still, uh, it's still very, very tough to actually see him. When I think about him, it's a different story. But when I actually see him, I'm like, oh, my God. Sometimes I, I mean, I got to be honest. Sometimes I just think, oh, my God, what a waste. What a waste. He had so much to offer. Uh, by the way, a, a few people asked, uh, the shirt that Guy Fieri was, uh, Fietti, Guy Fieri, uh, was wearing last night. Uh, you can get that at opiradio.com. It's not a shameless plug because I'm not keeping that money from the Ruiz and crap. But uh, people have been asking, uh, yes, that particular shirt is up there, uh, opiradio.com, all right? But, um, yeah, everyone said the show came out great. I was very, very surprised they decided to do another uh, tribute episode for Carl. I guess it's going to be the thing as far as April Fool's uh, goes every year. So that's good, man. That's, that's a solid dude right there, that guy Fietti, that he's keeping Carl's name alive like that. That is pretty fucking awesome, to say the least. And uh, I, uh, we're right around Carl's birthday now. And that means we're also right around the one-year anniversary of Vic Henley's death. Oh, my God. It's just, just, I just can't. <sighs> it's just unbelievable to me. Vincent Scaramuzzo, I'm sorry about your friend, pale. I'm not, I'm not alone in this. Carl uh, had a way of making you feel like you really, really knew him. And I think in a lot of ways you really did uh, know him. He, he gave that extra little bit to everybody. If you showed uh, appreciation toward Carl, he was going to show right back to you. And I think I've learned that from Carl. Uh, I woke up uh, with a lot of people saying, uh, happy anniversary. We are the kings of the April Fool's prank. <laughs> the Opie and Anthony show. <laughs> Every year, we're, uh, we're mentioned in articles as one of the biggest April Fool's pranks in the history of April Fool pranks, or April Fool's pranks. I can't believe it was 23 years ago today. Right around now, maybe a little later, I called up a very, very sleepy Anthony and said, uh, I want to do this today on the radio. He said, sure, okay, oh, okay, all right. And just hung up and went back to bed as I was pacing my apartment. Then we went on the radio and uh, told Boston that the mayor died in a fiery car wreck while he was in uh, Florida. Two weeks later, we were gone. Not going to lie, it was part of my master plan, so... For a while, I was too scared to mention that, but uh, now, for many years now, I've, I've admitted it. I was really, really pissed off. I knew that I had a great radio show that could take over the uh, the radio world. And, uh, you know, up there in Boston, Bruce Mittman, the general manager, who obsesses about Trump, by the way. He's a, he's a Trumper. Uh, I have a love-hate relationship with the guy because he truly, well, first of all, he hired us. You know, we didn't have a lot of experience as far as a radio show, me and Anthony at that time. I had a lot of radio experience. Anthony was very green. And us working together was very, very new. But he saw the vision. He saw what uh, I saw. He hired us in the end. And then he took advantage of us. He knew we were a rocket ship. And he was uh, 
He was keeping us down. Barely paying us any money. And uh, we did a quick three years up there in Boston. And wow, did we do good. And uh, I went to Bruce Mittman many times. I'm, I'm saying to him, look, this show is way bigger than what's going on right now at WAAF, the only station that really rocks. So I wanted to be syndicated. I wanted to be making real fucking money. Uh, the fact is, I went to Boston on a contract that was paying me $40,000 a year. And I brought Anthony in at $28,000. Uh, by the way, they wanted to give me $60,000. I was at WBAB, the home of rock and roll out of Babylon. And uh, Ron Valeri, the program director, he uh, would go back to Long Island on the weekends to see family or his wife's family or whatever. And he heard me on the radio and said, oh, my God, I want to hire this guy. So he actually uh, called me up and said, look, uh, I got nights open up here in uh, the Boston area, and we'd like to hire you. And uh, I said, well, I'm doing nights at WBAB, the home of rock and roll. And uh, I said, why would I leave this? This is where I live to go do the exact shift somewhere else in a foreign lawn. I don't want to go to a foreign lawn unless you make it worth my while. Whoa, what was that? What the hell was that notification? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> what was that? That was a new notification. Ooh, maybe someone liked one of my TikTok videos. Um, so uh, I still was talking to him. He's like, look, uh, you know, what I can offer you is more money. How much are you making down there at uh, WBAB? And I was making about, I don't know. Something like forty-five to forty-eight thousand dollars. No, forty thousand dollars. Sorry, I'm getting all my numbers mixed up because of that notification. I was making about forty. He goes, "Well, this is what I can do. You can do the exact same shift. Uh, Boston's a bigger market, and uh, we'll give you sixty thousand. I'm like, "Well, goddamn, I might be able to pay my car off." And then I said, well, I'm working with this new guy. He's very green in the business, but he's a natural at this. His name is Anthony. And I'm going to send you a tape of some of our work, Ron Valeri. And he goes, well, that's very interesting because we also have afternoon drive open. I'm like, well, now you piqued my interest, Ron Valeri. I'm going to send you a tape, a cassette tape. And I want you to listen to it closely, my friend. Long story short, he listened to the uh, the cassette tape and went, oh, my God, and hired us immediately. He goes, but here's the problem. I'm like, what's the problem, Ron Valeri? You know that $60,000 I just offered you? I got to take some of that money back if, uh, if it's going to be you and Anthony. I'm like, well, you son of a bitch. You can afford this. And uh, long story short, he goes, I'll give you your $40,000 that you're making now. I'm like, what? what the F? This is radio for you in a nutshell. Uh, because I got to use that extra 20000 to get your pal Anthony on board. And then I'm like, look, Anthony ain't coming up here for, your, for fucking $20,000. I'll tell you right the fuck now. And then... Uh, he got Anthony up to $28,000 to do afternoons at WAF, the only station that really rocks. And I was making forty. So at first, yes, I was making more money than Anthony. But that was based on all of my years of experience in radio. And uh, when we moved to New York, I made good on that. And we always uh, made the exact same money moving forward. Okay. But I felt like I was sacrificing because I had the 60000 on the table from Ron Valeri. And he goes, well, I got to take that 60000 back. And if you do the math, if you're making uh, 40 and he's making 28, I'm actually paying you more as a show. I'm like, well, goddamn, Ron Valeri, you're absolutely right about that. So me and Anthony went to Boston. I was making $40,000. Anthony was making $28,000. And next thing you know, we just destroy 
in Boston. Absolutely destroy. And we put out a CD. These, This is where the love-hate relationship, uh, uh, you know, is with Bruce Mittman. Mostly Bruce Mittman. The, the PD guy, he was, he was, you know, we walked all over him. He wasn't going to make or break us. It was all about making sure Bruce was happy. So, uh, you know, they, they do a station CD where some of these bands came in and did some acoustic stuff, and it was nice. And then they offered all their, um, their, all their talent, all their radio shows, uh, a track on the disc. So send in your best stuff, and they put it all together. And I'll be honest with you, everyone else's uh, bits on the Unusual Suspect CD were lame. Very lame bits. And me and Anthony, our bits really stood out to the point where the guy said, you know what? I want you guys to make your own say day. I'm like, well, God damn, this is going to be another way where I can pay some of my bills. So me and Anthony make this CD called Demented World. And these scumbags up there, this is why radio sucks. They're like, well, we can't give you all the money for the CD. And I'm like, why, man? We're making no fucking money, you know? And they're like, uh, you know, we'll give you 75 cents a, a disc. So that means me and Anthony were splitting like 37 and a half cents each per CD. And the rest of the money went to a charity, but they couldn't find a charity because at this point, a lot of people thought we were scumbags. I remember uh, famously the Jimmy Fund said, we ain't taking your free money if it's coming from Opie and Anthony. Ah, hell nah. We'd rather have sick kids than take your money. I don't know if that was the actual discussion, but uh, I do know they said no to our charity money that we wanted to give them for the Demented World CD. That is true. So then they came up with some kind of uh, minority veterans uh, charity. And they got all the money from the Demented World CD. Well, I was still shopping for cans at the supermarket because that money doesn't go uh, that far. And we're just crushing it. We're crushing it. And we're beating BCN. And BCN, they had a guy named uh, Mark Perino, And I knew he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars in afternoon drive. And me and Anthony are making nothing as we're crushing it. So all this is in the back of my head. Like these sons of bitches. And then I got radio companies from all over the country calling up going, we want to know your availability. And uh, one of those uh, companies, you know, was very sneaky, sneaky. And they said, why don't you come down to New York? So we, uh, we, we snuck out of, uh, out of Boston. I think we made an excuse why we couldn't do the show that day. I don't remember the details of that, to be honest with you, but I, I assume that's how it played out uh, because they definitely didn't want to meet us on the weekend. And we got to New York, and we had a, a lovely meeting with CBS Radio. It turns out that um, WBCN was also paying attention to uh, Opie and Anthony and telling corporate, these guys up here in Boston, are kiss uh, they're kicking our ass. Maybe you want to hire them, get them out of this market, and then, uh, you know, they can help the company in New York. So uh, we went down to New York. We had this meeting, and uh, they're like, we want to hire you, man. We want to put you on one of our stations here in New York at Afternoon Drive. And now I'm thinking, oh, my God, we get to move home. And they were offering uh, way more money. And uh, the one guy, leaving the names out of the story today, the one guy basically says to me, to me, it's too bad you're under contract. Now we have to go backwards a little bit. Because what happened was, as I was telling Bruce Mittman, this show is, uh, is a, a rocket ship. And you're not taking advantage of it. There's way more money to be made. We want to be making way more money. We want to be syndicated. So go to corporate and, and tell them to figure out how to syndicate Opie and Anthony. Damn it. And so... Uh, Bruce didn't see it that way, and they were giving us just tiny, tiny little raises here and there. And then famously, it was time to renegotiate our contracts, 
And uh, hold on. This guy says, be more funny. What a fucking loser you are, my friend. Goodbye, loser. I'm hilarious. Anyway, um, so Bruce uh, famously uh, takes me and Anthony to a Chinese buffet restaurant on Route 9 outside of, uh, I want to say, Framingham to go local. And... Uh, and he sits us down and he's talking about how great we're doing and, you know, it's time to, you know, get a new contract going. We had no representation. I was representing us, not bragging about that because I had no business representing us. But that's all I, that, you know, what, I, I, I did my best. And Bruce Mittman famously babbling how great we are and how good we're doing and the CD, oh my God, which, which sold well over 100,000 copies, by the way, and we saw barely any money for that. Um and then it's time to show us the number he, he's offering us to continue at WAF, the only station that really rocks. And he, uh, he writes a number on a paper like we're in some dumb mob movie. And, uh, oh, corn dog, you got me. He wrote on the YouTube, Opie, you suck and you're a loser. And I was ready to go, oh, yeah. And then he wrote April Fool's. He, 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 he. <laughs> All right. So Bruce Mittman, he writes this number on, on the paper and slides it over to us. This is what I'm about to pay you guys. Are you ready for this? And I, I wish I had a relationship with Anthony because I would love to call him and go, what was the number? Um, I will say the number was something like a between a two and $5,000 raise. And this is after we were beating BCN in Afternoon Drive, which was never done before because WAF, to get a little uh, inside, had a terrible signal. So it made it almost impossible to beat the actual Boston stations. We were in the suburbs, and Boston obviously had uh, WBCN right in the heart of Boston. And we were crushing and beating them. And knowing the guy in afternoons, Mark Moreno, was making hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, if if uh, if AAF turned around and said, you know what, it's worth it, and gave me and Anthony $100,000 each, I think this story would be much different, to be honest with you. So in the end, Bruce Mittman blew it. He really blew it. So he slides the paper over. Anthony was the one that turned it over. And like I said, it was something like a two to $5,000 raise after, after everything we did for uh, this radio station. And uh, Anthony just openly started laughing at Bruce Mittman at this dumb, stupid offer. <laughs> and just laughed. And we're like, and then he slides the paper to me, you know, and I look, I'm like, oh my God. And in my head, you got to remember that, you know, me and Anthony already knew that we took a little trip to New York and they really wanted to hire us, hire us, excuse me, but they looked at me and said, it's too bad you're under contract, but I never forgot the guy saying that. So then my whole thought process was, um, Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm messing up the story maybe a little bit because I said going backwards. Uh, anyway, after that Chinese restaurant thing, okay, I got to fix this. I got to fix this. Oh, my God. I got to fix this. Okay. Um, we had – no, we had no other offers at the time. Oh, my God. This is important to the story. Uh, we had no other offers at the time, and I was begging, you know, Bruce, that we want to make more money. We want to be syndicated. Uh, you know, BCN pays their guys way more. So we didn't have the offers in New York yet. Okay, Jesus, that's really important, actually. So even though we were laughing at the piece of paper that was slid over to us, we also knew, like, we have to sign. We have nothing else. And that, and they knew that. They had all the leverage in this negotiation. They knew it. So we begrudgingly signed this damn thing. And we were really mad about it, but we had no other choice. And we're thinking, ah, maybe in two years, whatever the contract was for, we'll have another shot at this. Then... New York came a call and in other places. And then we took the trip to New York. So in the back of my mind, I, I had this uh, Chinese uh, buffet story. And, um, you know, in my head as they're offering me and Anthony uh, a chance to come to New York to do afternoon drive. Oh, my God. Um, anyway, 
So we go back to work. And then my whole goal was, how are we going to get uh, out of this contract so we could go work in New York? How are we going to do this? How the fuck are we going to do this? So uh, April Fool's came rolling around 23 years ago today. I called up Anthony. I said, I got the idea. And I knew uh, two things could happen. Uh, we would get fired for it. And then we, we would skate down uh, I-95 all the way to New York and have a wonderful career down there. Or it would make us even bigger in radio, Boston radio uh, specifically, and maybe that will lead to incredible opportunities. So I'm like, you know what? This is, this is a win-win uh, situation. So Anthony said, all right, I'll be there, whatever. All right, I'll see you later, you know. And uh, we go to WAF. I remember the moment we looked at each other like, are we really going to do this? And uh, both of us basically had the fuck it look in our eyes, turned on the mics, and announced to Boston that the mayor of Boston, Mayor Menino, died in a fiery car accident while uh, vacationing or while being in Florida. Wow. And I uh, recruited one of my friends who still does radio to this day. <laughs> he gets so nervous when I talk about this. I asked him if he could be like a news reporter out of Florida for us because he had that amazing radio voice. And he said, sure, no problem. What do you need? And I explained to him. So as the show went on, we went to him and he gave a news report that was very believable. Way more believable than us, by the way. Um I think people were way more gullible back then because I've listened to that show over the years and it doesn't even sound believable, to be honest with you. But um, then Dave Douglas comes running in in a panic. He was always running into the studio in a panic. And he's like, what the hell are you guys doing? And I'm like, oh, relax, we're just doing our April Fool's prank, you know? And he goes, well, just make sure by the end of the show, you just announce that it's an April Fool's prank. Oh, my God. And already the media was sniffing around and everything, and Dave kept coming in during commercial breaks. You're gonna, you're gonna announce that this is a, this is a prank, right? And he was getting really, really nervous. I guess he had every reason to be nervous. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we kept holding him off because he was basically trying to tell me go on the radio right now and say it's a prank. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, it's. Uh, the last break, me and Anthony uh, are babbling, babbling, babbling. And right at that moment, we should have said, this is an April Fool's prank. We said, we'll see you tomorrow. Rocco's up next. And played a song where the commercials. And Dave Douglas was waiting outside the studio. His eyes were as big as whatever's, whatever you use there, saucers. And he was in shock. He could not believe. He could not believe that we didn't say it was a prank. Jim Sullivan on the YouTube. Hope he planned the whole thing out. Master plan, baby. Incredible super villain mind. April Fool's all. Yes, I planned the whole thing out because I was very, very mad at uh, what we were accomplishing and uh, the lack of money that we were getting for it. And I just knew radio like the back of my hand, and I knew uh, the people that came before me. I knew that uh, when they did pranks like this, they, uh, you know, they ended up getting huge raises or bigger jobs in, in bigger cities. I knew, I knew all that. I mean, that world certainly changed. And then all of a sudden, when radio guys started doing these over-the-top stunts, they were getting fired left and right. It was no longer about um, moving the needle and getting yourself a bigger job and way more money. It got to a point where they're like, oh, oh my God, we got to fire this guy. He's insane. But there was a time, jocks were doing this all the time and getting much bigger jobs. And that was the case with us. So then uh, I sat back, like, waiting for the phone to ring for New York. And uh, <laughs> didn't ring at first. And I was like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Tommy Chesh, prank war champion. That's right. That's right. Paulie D, you have nothing, brother. You have nothing. 
So I'm sitting back like, all right, just waiting for the master plan to take effect. The phone didn't ring right away. We were in a lot of trouble in Boston. It was getting freaking scary. Um, they, uh, well, they, they, uh, they finally said, all right, we've decided what we're going to do. Because it was about a week or so where uh, we were suspended and they were trying to figure it out. And in the end, they were just trying to figure out who knew what. You know, it was funny because for a little bit, I thought we might have skated. Like I said, if we skated, that was pretty good for us as well. Um, but I was stupid. They knew right away they were going to fire us. But they were trying to figure out who else they were going to fire, like who else knew about this. But I kept this plan to myself. The only other person that knew was Anthony. We didn't tell the station. We didn't tell Bruce. We didn't tell Dave. We didn't tell Rocco. We didn't tell Osterlin. Never told Hillman Hillman anything. He was just a corporate douche the entire time we were up there. Fuck that guy. Um, and so they finally said, "All right, we got uh, we got to meet with you guys." And they're like, "Come down to Boston." I'm like, <laughs> and me and Anthony drove together. I think I even was saying, "Well, well, well, if they're if they're uh, having us drive all the way to Boston, maybe maybe we're not getting fired." Oh, what idiots! So uh, we drive all the way to Boston. I remember it was hard to find parking. And then we go to this uh, building. And they see us into this conference room with a giant table. Oh, my God, a giant table. Every time me and Anthony had a meet in a room with a giant table, it, it never worked out for us. And this guy, uh, I forgot his name. I like that I forgot some of these guys' names. And this guy actually um, that ended up firing us years later. He he loved our ass and used to you know kiss our ass. And I think I even played golf with him at a charity event. That's how weird the the world is. Uh, Balukis, I think his name is. He comes walking in, and he fired us immediately. And we're just like, holy shit, holy shit. And I'm sitting there like, okay. Because now I'm getting a little nervous because, like I said, the, the New York call didn't come in uh, right after the April Fool's prank. <laughs> and now we're fired. And I'm like, oh, my God, what did I just do? Because, you know, in the end, we were crushing it up in Boston. And then um, me and Anthony just left there in shock. And we found the nearest bar, which was that um, – what the hell was that uh, bar called on Newbury Street? Uh yeah, you, you walk down into it. Uh, I want to say Daisy Dukes or something like that, but that 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 name sounds a little suspicious, right? Someone up there in Boston, help me out. What was the name of that bar? It sounded like Daisy Dukes or something like that. We went in there, we had a few beers, and as we're having a few beers, our faces popped up on the TV. And it said fired. And I'm like, well, how the hell did the news stations know we were fired before we were? Before we do, I mean. Just had our dopey faces with a big red fired across our faces. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, Don Belucas. All right, Billy DeTore knows Don Belucas. Daisy uh, Buchanan. Thank you, Jim Sullivan. Give yourself a, uh, I don't know, a pat on the back, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Okay. Daisy, Bu Daisy Buchanan's, which was a great little joint on Newbury Street up there in Boston. I don't know if they're still around. And, uh, oh, man, there were our faces across the TV. And then uh, we got, I probably got a little drunk and then probably drove home drunk. <laughs> At this point, who cares? <laughs> oh, just jokes, people. I'm sure I was drinking responsibly because I was the one driving. And then um, New York finally uh, finally called, and uh, I'm like, oh, here we go. All right, here we go. I left out a lot. I left out the uh, – all right, let me – before I do the New York call. So then the coverage was getting crazy, man, crazy. And they wanted an interview with, uh, with Opie and Anthony, and uh, – the day after the prank, they caught us in like the, the hallway or the elevator area of WAF, the only station that really rocks. And they were hiding in the break room. So when me and Anthony were leaving, 
they already had a news crew there. I think that was the day we actually did it because I don't think we ever went back into WAF after the famous show. So they already had news crews uh, trying to get us, and they hid in our break room. And that video is online, and oh, my God, I look like a complete and utter ass surfer dude not taking any responsibility thinking it's the greatest thing ever but they uh they jumped out of the break room with the cameras uh lit up trying to trying to get uh something from us and then uh yeah i said a couple things <clears throat> that didn't go over well oh and then the pies oh my god i got too much more to say Ugh. um oh jesus so anyway the coverage was getting crazy and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm about to, to, to watch the news. Because, you know, now I'm watching the news because they're talking about Opie and Anthony around the clock. And all of a sudden, I'm like, that shot looks very, very familiar, man. This news crew, they're, they're outside. And I, I feel like I know where they are. And I'm trying to figure it out, right? And then I went, oh, my God, they're in my front yard. <laughs> The news crew set up in the front yard of my house. And I don't know if that footage is available anymore, but if you really look closely, you'll see me uh, peeking out one of the windows as they're basically telling all of Boston that we're just terrible, terrible people. And wait to hear what these terrible, terrible people did. And one of the terrible, terrible people lived right behind me in this house. <laughs> oh, my God. And then the paparazzi or the local paparazzi, they would be chasing us down the road. It was uh, it was scary. And then I had um, two story state troopers going by my house very, very slowly. I never knew what that was about. But uh, the mayor was really, really pissed. And I don't know, it felt like a little intimidation. But the troopers would drive by my house very slowly. They made sure I knew they were driving by my house very slowly. They never stopped. There's nothing more to that story. And it could be pure paranoia, but that is a fact, Jack. So then uh, during that whole thing, uh, Bruce Mittman, he knew that he had rock stars and he was just trying to do everything he could to, you know, save us. And he's like, you know what, if I could just get to the mayor and apologize, I think I can make this whole thing go away. There were two things that were going on. Bruce Mittman said, I, if I could get to the mayor and apologize, I think I could save my b -b 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 boys. He used to call us his b -b 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 boys. So that was his goal. And then Dave, our PD, came up with this dumb thing. Let's get a whole bunch of pies. We'll tell the mayor, you know, it was just a prank and it was all uh, all in fun. And we'll put him in stockades down at Faneuil Hall and the mayor could throw pies at Opie and Anthony and the fans could throw pies at Opie and Anthony. And I looked at Dave and I said, no one's throwing a fucking pie at my face while I'm in a stockade. And to Anthony's credit, he said the exact same thing. Like, no, we ain't doing that. And so that led to the pallet of pies going to the, you know, the children's hospital for another photo op, which I explained on uh, the live stream a couple weeks ago, actually. So see, it all kind of comes together. So uh, back to Bruce Mittman. Bruce Mittman, uh, <laughs> Bruce Mittman finds out where the mayor is going to be. He's got a uh, photographer that's following him. Bruce Bittman, true story, pretty much hides in a bush waiting for the mayor to appear after his appearance or before his appearance, jumps out, and the photographer was cued in basically saying, you know, when I uh, shake the mayor's hand, you better be clicking that damn camera. So uh, Bruce jumps out of the bush, reaches out his hand to the mayor. The mayor's a politician. Of course, he's going to shake your hand, then says, I'm Bruce Mittman. I'm uh, Opie and Anthony's bosses, and I want to apologize to you. And the photographer's like, click, 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 taking a million fucking pictures. And uh, that picture was published somewhere. I, I do have a copy of that somewhere. 
And, uh, you know, the mayor basically said that he was bamboozled. He would have never shook the hand of Opie and Anthony's bosses. But, you know, uh, Bruce was brilliant in his own right. And uh, and he got that done, but it didn't, didn't work, obviously. So we got fired. And then finally, okay, finally the phone starts ringing. It's the New York guys. They're like, man, obviously you're out of contract. And we still would love to hire you guys, but I don't know, man. That that was really, really bad what you guys did. And uh, I'm like, well, I, I mean, and then I try to explain, blah, blah, blah. I did it because I knew that, uh, you know, you guys wanted to hire us and uh, I was stuck in this contract and that, 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 which makes a, a company scary because they're basically thinking, wait, if they're willing to do this with their current employer, they might do that the same exact thing to us, eh, which we might have did. Well, we did, but that was different circumstances with the sex for Sam thing. So uh, the guy goes, I'll tell you what, you got to go fly down to Washington, D.C. and plead your case to Dan Mason. Dan Mason was in charge of programming for all of CBS radio. He had a beautiful office in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., we flew into uh, Ronald Reagan Airport, took a really, really, really long ride out to the suburbs where Dan Mason was uh, hanging out. And uh, we packed our bags because I'm thinking CBS Radio is now going to wine and dine Opie and Anthony. We're going to have a good old time in Washington, uh, Washington D.C. for a couple days. They're going to put us up in a fancy hotel. We're going to have fancy steak dinners. And then by the end of it, we're going to have a, a kick-ass multi-million dollar job. <laughs> so we uh, take this long ride out to the suburbs, and uh, Dan Mason shows us in. I remember that Tom Petty was playing um, while we were waiting for uh, Mr. Mason. And then uh, we walk in. We talk to him for maybe five minutes, maybe ten minutes. He realized that uh, we're just aggressive radio guys with all the talent in the world and that we're not crazy. And we did what we did to kind of further our careers along. And within 10 minutes, I didn't even have to give a great spiel, to be honest with you. And within 10 minutes, he's like, all right, I'm satisfied. I'm going to give uh, my guys in New York permission to hire you. Can I call you a cab back to the airport? And me and Anthony looked at each other like, what the? What? What about the fancy hotel and the state dinners? And next thing you know, we're rolling our uh, our suitcases because we packed. We packed for a good time. <laughs> next thing you know, we're back in Boston in the same day having dinner. Well, separately, obviously. Anthony went home to his uh, his miserable wife. I went home to my miserable girlfriend. I'm, I'm sitting there going... This was an amazing day. I should be down in Washington in a fancy hotel going out to a, a, a great state dinner. And instead, I'm sitting in this house with someone I don't even love. Anyway, we packed our bags and we drove down I-95 and we said, hello, WNEW. Although, uh, at the time, CBS Radio said, uh, I said this uh, recently on the live stream, CBS Radio said, look, you could pick either K-Rock, which was very, very similar to WAF, the only station that really rocks, or you could pick WNEW, which was a very legendary uh, rock station in New York, but uh, was on its last leg. And me and Anthony agreed, like, look, why don't we keep doing what we've been doing? We we know the music and everything, and we know the lifestyle, so we picked K-Rock. And then they came back to us and said, uh, yeah, you can't pick K-Rock. But I said, I said, but you told me to pick either K-Rock or NEW. I know we said that, but... And then it came out, you know, Howard uh, threw a, a hissy fit, even though we weren't even uh, Opie and Anthony yet, as far as, like, most people know us. You know, they knew Opie and Anthony in Boston, obviously, but we weren't nationally known yet. And Howard threw a baby boy fit and basically said, I don't want him on my station. 
And that might have caused, you know, some of the bad blood that uh, I certainly still have to this day. So we're like, all right, we'll go to WNEW. And then uh, we went over there and, uh, you know, we destroyed. Happy April Fools, bitches. Boo 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 bo